It's time to talk about the very best comic books you could find this week. And here with me is my good friend Gabe from Comical Opinions and Weird Science DC. How you doing, Gabe? Uh, happy day to you, my friend Wes. Thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm happy to talk about the best of instead of the worst of. Normally, we're dominated by indie comics, but this one's a little bit more even. We got a couple of indies, a couple of Marvel comics, a couple of DC comics. I thought DC was going to have a bigger week, but turns out there was some quality missing here and there. Let's talk about the indie comics first. Me personally, I'm recommending Twig number three from Image Comics, Scotty Young, Kyle Stram on art. I think this comic book absolutely looks beautiful. It's a nice all ages heroes journey that we're on. The first two issues were strictly world building, kind of fleshing out the world. And what was at stake on this journey for Twig and his sidekick? And this issue finally starts talking about the character his perspective and what he's going through as he's learning that there are repercussions for his actions, that there's a lot riding on what he is able to accomplish. I kind of like this one. We don't get a lot of good heroes journeys and we're starting to see Twig change along the way and become a better character. So I was quite enamored with this one. Are you a big fan of all ages comics like Twig? Well, I, I do like all ages comics, especially one that's as beautifully drawn as this one. I mean, this, I mean, if you're looking for bright, colorful, um, visuals, uh, character de designs that are uh, immediately attractive and memorable. I mean, th this is definitely one of those titles. Uh, this is the first exposure for me for Twig, uh, and I kind of got into the story a little bit. I think I need to go back and e read issues one and two. Uh, so I sort of got what was going on, and it was pretty accessible going into number three, Cold. Uh, and it is an interesting story, but it is also very all agey. So if you're if you're looking for a big, uh, exciting, <laughs> wow moments maybe something a little grittier or more mature this isn't it uh but it looks great it reads well it's very accessible so if you're looking for something that's uh, good for the whole family uh, this is probably a good pick yeah we, before we started uh, recording you said you wanted more bush i was like i don't think you're gonna get that in twig well <laughs> <laughs> maybe not for every particular comic that's i'm just messing with you i'm just messing with you. I, I said that <laughs> not enough exposure to decapitation sure <laughs> you're recommending from a blaze comics Promethe 1313 andy diggle writing sean martinborough on art i have mm -hmm. not read this one yet i'm a big fan of a blaze specifically them going out and curating the best comic books from the european scene bringing them over to America, and they have started doing their own things. I'm not sure if this is something that has been out so far, but it's certainly something that I will read because I am enjoying the blaze. What was it about Prometheus 1313 that really stands out? Well, first things first, I'm with you. I'm not sure how to pronounce that first word. It's either Prometheus or Promethee or something like that, but regardless it was an interesting story from the from the perspective of the whole idea is you have this uh one woman who was abducted abducted according to her by aliens as a child and throughout the course of her life uh her abduction story has been analyzed and cataloged and reported on and dramatized throughout uh th many years up until the time she's an adult and through that time she has been receiving visions that she believes are from her abduction uh forecasting an imminent an alien invasion that's going to end the world and so what's happened is over the course of years and time cults government organizations um uh, secret organizations that are not tied to any particular government have come to believe that her visions are real and you get this overwhelming tone and mood of building paranoia especially because it doesn't quite exactly answer whether or not her experience is real so now you're at this point where you're wondering is the end of the world coming in just a couple of days or is it just mass hysteria that everybody is just losing their minds and going to this this collective state of panic? And it's all about the mood and the tension and this building sense of dread and paranoia and fear that really gets you. I mean, if you're looking for big popping visuals and big exciting alien invasions, you don't get that because it's all about the people to start. And we'll see where the series goes. But as, as far as an issue number one goes, I, I was very happy with it. I'm personally like a take it or leave it with Andy Diggle. Either I really like what he's doing or I don't like what he's doing. It sounds like this is kind of up my alley. I do like the sci-fi stuff. I do like some end of the world types of tales. And do we have a reliable narrator, not kind of a mystery put into a comic book? Yep, that's exactly what this is. Let's go over to the big two. We're going to start out with Marvel Comics, and I'm going to get some some pushback on this one. I know that uh, Gabe doesn't so much agree with my recommendation. Yep. Amazing Spider-Man number five, Zeb Wells, John Romita Jr. This is the conclusion to the very first arc 
because we do have Amazing Spider-Man 900 coming up and we need to celebrate Spider-Man. So it does kind of end abruptly, but I've really enjoyed the fights between Tombstone and Spider-Man. And we do see a version of Spider-Man that we don't see all that often. We don't typically see Peter Parker enraged. We don't normally see him mad. He's more fun-loving. And even when somebody does something bad to him, he doesn't normally even consider going over the line. And I like seeing that Tombstone has pushed him this far, and I thought it was pretty darn good. The visuals from John Romita Jr. are not to my taste, but I'm getting over that, I guess. And I kind of enjoyed it for what it was. Well, yeah. So you and I, I think, disagree. Not necessarily that it's a bad comic, but that... Personally, I, did, I wouldn't care for the ending. Now, in, in Zeb Wells' defense, I really, really, really liked uh, how Zeb Wells has developed Tombstone over the course of this arc. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed how he made him a more dangerous, more intimidating character than even Kingpin or the, some of the other uh, more uh, advanced gangsters that Spider-Man typically comes up with. I, I, what I didn't care for is the, the, the big wow moments, the big confusing sort of almost cross the line frustrating moments that are introduced in, in issue number one are not at all resolved or at least developed past the end of this arc or, or i should say into the end of this arc the arc just sort of ends and you get sort of well maybe we'll get back to it sometime in the future in this day and age of marvel i, I, I that's a lot to ask for a customer and, and personally I, I found it a bit of a turnoff the second piece that i, I didn't quite care for I, I know this is best of but i'm just trying to explain where i'm coming from is it was a very sort of talk heavy dialogue heavy ending that just basically put Spider-Man and Tombstone at a tentative truce. There wasn't a big wow moments. There weren't big action moments. There weren't any big revelations that came out of that issue. It just, as you say, it just sort of ends. Now, to be fair, on the on the technical execution, it was good to find. Uh, Ramita Jr.'s art's, you know, an acquired taste, so you kind of have to get past that. And the the ending of how they established the truce between Spider-Man and Tombstone was uh, smart. Uh, maybe not entirely clever, but it was pretty smart. But for, I mean, just for me, it was it was a bit of a letdown for where they what you would call the end of an arc. Uh, so I was hoping for more out of that. But just on technical execution, it was fine. I'm with you. I'm bit, I am a bit frustrated that they introduced this big explosion that happened after mm -hmm. six months of isolation, and we got kids and Mary Jane and all these things that kind of discombobulate the reader, and then we essentially forget that they ever happened and don't address them for the next three months. So I get you there, but um, I yep. think it was perfectly fine. As far as what Marvel's putting out, it's better than most. It's definitely now, there, better than most of what you get from Marvel these days, yes. There is a better comic book this week. It's King Conan number six, Jason mm -hmm. Aaron, Mahmoud Asrar. Jason Aaron is basically finishing up King Co or Conan the Barbarian at Marvel Comics with this issue. He will be in Savage Avengers, I think, a little bit, but this is, for all intents and purposes, the last Conan story we're getting. I say it's the second best Conan story they've created after Savage Sword of Conan with Jerry Duggan and Ron Gardy on it, but this one is absolutely fantastic. The visuals, Mahmoud Osrard is a fantastic choice to be a Conan writer, and um, as far as what Jason Aaron is doing at Marvel, which I think is a lot more bad than good, this is easily the best. Yeah, this is one of those scenarios where you can look at a writer who maybe is not getting the best press, especially for his work on Avengers with Jason Aaron, uh, and say, well, maybe it's he's not a bad writer. It's just maybe he's just better on certain types of properties. He is really good on solo Conan uh, stories. King Conan has been good from start to finish. There has not been a single flaw in this uh, arc since the first issue. There was a little bit of a controversy with uh, Princess Prima, I think it is, who is the uh, the princess, <laughs> and, and some allusions <laughs> to being Pocahontas, and we all know how that turned out. Uh, but this was a great ending. There was big battles. There was even a big explosion for Conan book. It, it, how they do it makes sense. There was resolution, and there was sort of that grim, gritty Conan moving forward against the world kind of uh, ending that, that you just love to see for that for that type of character. So uh, as far as Conan books go, this is one of the, the better ones that I've seen recently. A Blaze does it a little bit better, but I mean, as far as anything that Marvel's been putting out that's Conan related, this is probably the almost the best that I've seen from them in a very long time. And uh, you know, kudos to Jason Aaron. Uh, it's it's unfortunate. That, well, I won't say it's unfortunate, but uh, Marvel has lost the license for Conan, so that's now moved over to Titan Comics, who is based out of Europe. Uh, so there's probably some reason why it, it got cut as short as it did. But the way they ended it didn't feel rushed. 
It didn't feel like they left a bunch of stuff out. It ended it exactly how it needed to, and, and it felt like a, a satisfying, proper conclusion to that story. As an enormous fan of Code 8, I was surprised. Marvel kind of got, gets it right in the end. There are some, some ups and downs along the way, but King Conan is definitely an up. Let's go over to DC Comics. They kind of had a big week. We had the big uh, issue for the event. We had a new Batman writer. Me, personally, I thought Batman 125 from Chip Zdarsky and Jorge Jimenez is the best comic book they put out this week. I did have an issue with the characterization on Penguin, but otherwise, I think it was a really exciting issue. The visuals from Jorge Jimenez were absolutely breathtaking, specifically when he goes to the window and rips him out. And I think it was a pretty damn good take on the character, and it really sets the tone for what Chip Zdarsky's want to do with Batman. It's going to be pretty ominous. It's going to be pretty dark. And there are some stakes involved here. We see some some really big reveals in this issue. Yep. Uh, the art from Jorge Jimenez is fantastic. It is raw. It is moody. It is uh, dramatic. And, and everything that you're looking for in a kind of a Batman detective story with action. Uh, Zdarsky's story also was good. I, I think that the, the, there are two down points that I, you know, you just can't wrap your head around is pe the characterization of Penguin is just bizarre. It was weird. It was not like any Penguin that we've ever seen before. It, I think it, and it was sort of changing Penguin to make the story work, uh, which is not the best way to start off that, this kind of story. But everything around that was excellent. The interaction between Batman and Tim Drake was great. Uh, the action sequences were fantastic. Uh, the resolution kind of brings you to Batman heading towards some new place in his life. And, and then we get a little bit of an epilogue with the introduction of a new villain named Failsafe. And it was, a, it was a very abrupt introduction, so we'll see how it goes. But, I mean, as far as Batman stories go, this is, this is definitely one of the top issues coming out from DC this week. Yeah, I really enjoyed that one. The other one I'm going to recommend... Flashpoint Beyond number three, Jeff Johns, Jeremy Adams, Tim Sheridan, Germanico. I've enjoyed this series. I don't know if it needs to exist, but I do enjoy what Jeff Johns has been doing in here. Obviously, he's got a couple of co-writers this time. I like the murder mystery, and that is easily the best part of this comic book. I don't know that they needed to introduce this weird um, you know, alien extraterrestrial threat that's being introduced with this new version of Superman into the story. Perhaps they're going to make it work, but when they do the murder mystery stuff, I think Flashpoint Beyond is really an invigorating read. I, I tend to agree. The, 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 the best thing that comes out of uh, um, Flashpoint Beyond for me is the Easter eggs, honestly. It's looking at new versions of Poison Ivy, new versions of Swamp Thing, which in this case is not Alec Holland, uh, and it's also not Levi Kamei either, so there's something to chew on. Uh, new versions of the Fortress of Solitude, the new versions of Superman. You get to see all the different little bits and pieces that are basically Flashpoint uh, reimagined versions of characters that you already know. That's really the super duper fun of, of this particular series. You're right in that it sort of hasn't quite justified why it exists yet, and that's that's maybe its only um, take back on on why people are following it or like it so much. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the only thing that that uh, that you have to kind of wrap your head around is like why are we coming back to this? Now, having said that, there is an epilogue in this particular issue that. <laughs> ties Flashpoint Beyond more closely with uh, Dark Crisis and that there maybe there's there's something going on there. Now, will it play a bigger part in Dark Crisis than we originally thought or understood? Maybe. We'll see. Uh, but at least tying those two together kind of gives it a little bit of sense of purpose and possible justification. But um, in isolation, it's it's really Easter egg fun. And if you like that kind of thing, this is, this is a great pick. Now, speaking of Dark Crisis, I don't think either of us are recommending it. I personally had a, a – I was turned off from the issue because they promised a big fight between Nightwing and uh, and Deathstroke. And there is a fight, but it's not a big fight. You know, it's kind of epic, and then it just ends for no reason whatsoever. So that kind of had me let down on the issue. What were your thoughts of Dark Crisis since that was the big event going on? In isolation, the issue is fine as just a regular run-of-the-mill issue. But – that's the problem. It feels like a regular run-of-the-mill issue where stuff happens, but it's not very big. It's not very over-the-top exciting. It doesn't feel very impactful to what's going on with Dark Crisis. It just feels like a sort of a run-of-the-mill issue. And that's kind of the problem. Dark Crisis is supposed to be DC's big event for the year, uh, not just for the month or a couple or a couple months, but for the year. And it's supposed to shake everything up. But yet we're getting into these little spat fights that don't have a much resolution 
uh, first between um, Nightwing and Do- Deathstroke, and then between uh, Jonathan Kent Superman and <laughs> Cyborg Superman, and it just sort of like peters out. Uh, I mean, it's okay, but it, it just doesn't go anywhere. The art's great. Can't complain about the art, but yeah, the reason I'm not recommending it is because this is supposed to be the big event for DC, and right now it just it's it's kind of falling limp a little bit, and that's that's not that's not great for a big event. I'm with you. That's kind of the way I came away with it as well. So I was a bit disappointing, but Batman 125, in my opinion, really delivers. We yep. got some really good indie comic book, uh, books out there, Marvel, DC as well. Gabe, thank you very much for joining us. Do you have any final oh, happy to be here. If you would like some more information on Batman 125, I did a full review, but I didn't spoil everything because there are so many kind of big moments, especially in the last third of this comic book issue. I didn't want to spoil everything for people wanting to read it. But if you need some more information on Batman 125, you're not convinced yet, definitely check this out. Get some peeks into that Jorge Jimenez art. Maybe you want to pick this up. 